Good morning, my name is Dr. Cynthia Magra. I'm the Director of Dramatic Pathology for Well Cornell Medicine. Welcome to our interesting case presentation. So, uh, the case we're going to present today is a 75-year-old female with a several-month history of fever of unknown origin as well as anemia. The clinical considerations in her case were primarily between myelodysplastic syndrome and intravascular B-cell lymphoma. So the patient underwent a bone marrow biopsy and she had multiple random skin biopsies. And uh, for purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the skin biopsy results. So what was done in terms of the assessment of the skin to potentially establish um, the diagnosis in this case? Well, normal skin was chosen and the normal skin samples were obtained from the mid upper back, the mid lower back, and the left arm. So this is just a low power of one of these three biopsies. And um, to, to basically summarize what the H and E assessment of these three biopsies were, that is hematoxin ES and the routine light microscopic assessment, there were no findings. And they were essentially completely and totally unremarkable, all three biopsies. However, when I did immunohistochemistry, um, looking for any evidence of uh, an insidious intravascular B cell process, um, and by that I mean I have performed CD20, CD79A, which are um, pan B cell markers. In fact, there were very subtle abnormalities. There were rare microvessels in two of the three biopsies that actually showed intravascular collections, albeit few, of B cells that were highlighted by CD20 and CD79A, even though light microscopically by routine aging assessment, um, there were no obvious intravascular uh, atypical cells. So let us look at um, some of these uh, images from the two biopsies that did show abnormalities. So what one is looking at here is a <clears throat> tiny microvessel. This is essentially um, a capillary, and the capillary is lined by endothelium. And within the lumen of this microvessel are larger atypical cells that are highlighted by CD20. CD20 being a pan B cell marker. This is another microvessel, again, of the same caliber, a, a capillary, small venule, whereby within the vascular lumen, even though these cells were not apparent through routine HD assessment, uh, could be picked up with another pan B cell marker, CD79A. So in fact, her random skin biopsies were consistent with intravascular B cell lymphoma, recognizing the extreme focality of the findings and the fact that the findings were largely limited to what I discerned in uh, immunohistochemical assessment. And she more or less had the same findings on her bone marrow biopsy. Um, she subsequently received systemic chemotherapy with RCHOP and um, has done very well and is currently alive and in remission. So as far as utilizing normal skin to diagnose um, systemic diseases, uh, in fact, there is a, a very significant role um, for biopsying normal skin. Um, first of all, there is no question that it does have utility when one is trying to diagnose atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, which is a hereditary complement regulatory protein uh, syndrome, whereby we typically use the normal deltoid skin uh, to look for high levels of microvascular C5B-9 and in general, the, the cutoff when we are diagnosing atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome is to see at least 10 
microvessels in a normal deltoid skin biopsy that has C5B-9 deposition um, within the vasculature with endothelial, subendothelial localization. Um, we can also see um, a lot of C5B-9 or MAC microvascular deposition in patients that have an interesting atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic, thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura overlap uh, syndrome. Um, we also know that the effector mechanism of endothelial cell injury in the setting of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is C5B-9, and so once again, this normal deltoid skin biopsy can find some utility in diagnosing catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. We've also found some very interesting findings when we look at normal skin, specifically deltoid skin, um, in patients who have idiopathic systemic capillary leak syndrome. These patients do have a lot of complement deposition in the microvessels um, to a degree that would indicate systemic complement pathway activation, very similar to what we see in atypical HOS. And interestingly, these patients will have in their normal skin biopsy evidence of an enhanced type 1 interferon signaling, which will be heralded by significant levels of MXA, that's the surrogate type 1 interferon marker, within the skin sample, typically localized to microvessels. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, we began to um, look at complement pathway activation in patients who had severe catastrophic um, COVID-19. And indeed, we were able to document evidence of systemic complement pathway activation in patients with severe and critical COVID-19 by utilizing, once again, the deltoid skin biopsy. And we showed that these patients had very high levels of complement in their normal deltoid skin with spike glycoprotein localization to microvessels that also had concurrent complement pathway activation. We know that um, patients with systemic lupus erythematosus, if you biopsy sun-exposed forearm skin, so not deltoid, but forearm skin, they will have significant deposits of immunoglobulin and complement um, within the epidermal base of membrane zone, whereby the degree of immunoglobulin deposition within the epidermal base of membrane zone defines a positive lupus fan test. Um, patients that have small fiber neuropathy of varied etiologies, oftentimes linked with uh, microvascular disease, perhaps best exemplified by small fiber neuropathy in the setting of diabetes, we can use the normal skin um, from the thigh and um, pretibial um, skin to assess for somatic and autonomic innervation uh, on thick sections to diagnose small fiber neuropathy. And finally, normal skin can be used to, to actually diagnose intravascular B-cell lymphoma, where we uh, look for that localization of neoplastic B-cells uh, to the microvessels. And um, I, I think it's very critical to understand that when you want to use the normal skin to diagnose intravascular B-cell lymphoma. You have to um, select skin sites that have a lot of fat, and the punch biopsy has to go into the subcutaneous fat um, because of the tendency for the intravascular neoplastic B-cells to typically localize to subcutaneous um, uh, microvessels. Um, and a multiplicity of biopsies, not just one biopsy, but um, at least three biopsies. So you want to do three biopsies of skin that has ample subcutaneous fat. And um, I always recommend abdominal, thigh, and arm uh, skin extending into the subcutis. And I would say that in patients with intravascular B cell lymphoma, if you do those three biopsies extending into fat, the um, sensitivity is very high for diagnosing intravascular B-cell lymphoma and will prevent the um, patient from having to undergo a, a more um, uh, invasive procedure like a brain biopsy. Uh, so let's talk about primary intravascular B-cell lymphoma. This is an intravascular proliferation of lymphoma cells, typically a B-cell derivation. Um, these neoplasms are primarily 
thought to be a post-germinal center of origin. Um, while the brain and skin are the most common sites of disease, hepatosplenic and bone marrow infiltration are also found to be common, while lymph node disease is rare. Fever, as exemplified by the case presented today, may be a presenting symptom. Um, clinical symptoms largely reflect the ischemic patterns of intravascular occlusion. So for example, if you can imagine in the skin, if they actually have skin manifestations of their intravascular B cell lymphoma, perhaps the classic would be a levodoid skin rash. Why? Because we tend to see that levodoid net-like skin rash when there are occlusive vascular events, which in this case would be vascular occlusion by neoplastic B cells. So a levodoid skin rash is one of the cardinal cutaneous hallmarks of intravascular B cell lymphoma. Um, there is a classification uh, scheme for intravascular B cell lymphoma. We have the Western versus Asian. The Western form has two main types. The central nervous system is commonly involved in intravascular B cell lymphoma. It certainly was the case in the second case I just presented, um, whereas peripheral nervous system involvement is rare. Um, there is an interesting isolated cutaneous variant where you only have the lymphoma localized to cutaneous microvessels um, without any evidence of extracutaneous disease, and it primarily affects young women, and the prognosis is um, obviously superior um, to the one that has multi-organ involvement, um, clearly. Now, in the Asian form, there is multi-organ failure um, among the symptoms are pyrexia, hypertension, nephritic syndrome, pancytopenia, autoimmune hemolytic uh, anemia, DIC, uh, hemophagocytic syndrome, and hepatosplenomegaly. So what about the phenotypic profile? Um, certainly, because most of these cases are B cell lineage, we will highlight the intravascular lymphocytes with standard pan B cell markers, CD20 and CD79A. Um, a significant percentage of these cases express apparently the pan T cell marker CD5. About 13% will express CD10. Um, because most of these lymphomas are not of germinal center origin, the germinal center marker B6 is typically negative. Um, the question is, why do these lymphoma cells um, remain inside the blood vessel and can't egress, can't move outside of the blood vessel? So it's a purely intravascular tumor. Well, this relates to a loss in the expression of CD29 and CD54, which I'll talk about presently. So this is a photomicrograph of a patient who did have a levodoid skin rash. In other words, had, had that type of net-like skin rash reflective of vascular occlusion. And here we can see that the blood vessel is occluded by large malignant cells that were proven through immunohistochemical assessment to um, be of um, B cell derivation. So why, does, wh why do these lymphoma cells remain inside the blood vessel and why can't they move outside of the blood vessel? Why is there no egress into the surrounding tissue? Um, that is really an um, important uh, question when we're trying to consider the pathophysiology of the intravascular localization. Well, CD29 represents the beta subunit of the integrin protein, a transmembrane receptor that is involved in signal transduction and maintenance of the extracellular matrix. CD2129, rather, is expressed on T cells, B cells, monocytes, platelets, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, mast cells, and weakly on neutrophils. CD54, or ICAM1, is a transmembrane glycoprotein usually expressed on leukocytes and endothelial cells and plays a critical role in lymphocyte migration. Both CD29 and CD54 absence on intravascular lymphocytes have remained important espousals regarding the pathogenetic basis of the intravascular localization of malignant lymphocytes. So basically, these proteins CD2954 are needed for cellular migration outside of the blood vessel, and these lymphoma cells 
do not express these critical proteins for cellular migration. And so this is uh, from some of my own work on intravascular lymphoma. Um, here we have CD54 highlighting many of the inflammatory cells outside of the blood vessel, but the occluded blood vessel, occluded by neoplastic cells, um, those cells in the blood vessel do not express CD54, this transmembrane glycoprotein, needed for migration. And here we have a nice collage um, showing the intravascular localization of your neoplastic B cells, highlighted by CD20. And here we have these two critical proteins involved in egress of lymphocytes and other leukocytes, CD29 and CD54. And you can see how the malignant B cells don't express 29, but the endothelium and surrounding inflammatory cells do. And once again, here in this vessel, it's actually an artery, we have some cells, not all of them, that don't express CD54, which is, however, expressed by endothelium and surrounding uh, cells. Well, that concludes um, this particular case presentation. And as you know, all of these presentations are available for download for um, self-study or if you wish to utilize any of the material for your own presentations, of course, you're always welcome to do so. Thank you very much.